We can now move on to the uh, technical part of the program. This morning we have two technical presentations. So our, our first presentation is by uh, uh, Jean-Michel Maynard. Uh, he, he's a faculty member here at the University of Ottawa. He did his undergraduate work at Laval University. He then got his PhD from the University of Toronto, did two postdocs in Germany, uh, one in Regensburg and the other at the uh, Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light. This is the uh, Max Planck that we are aligned with in our Max Planck Center, uh, working with uh, uh, Dr. Philip Russell. And Jean-Michel has been on the faculty here at the University of Ottawa starting in 2016. So please help me welcome Jean-Michel. Hi, everyone. Well, thank you very much uh, for the uh, kind of introduction. And uh, thank you, uh, Bob and uh, Bob Boyd and Paul Corkum for the uh, invitation to this uh, symposium. It, it is a honor and a pleasure to be presenting today about the uh, recent work that my group has done here at the University of Ottawa on pushing the limits of ultra-fast terahertz photonics. And this little cartoon that you see here is actually the outline of my talk. So I will start by telling you everything about this little uh, blue wavy line that you see here. This is a terahertz radiation, and I'm going to tell you what is terahertz and how it can be used in research and industry. And then I will tell you about a technique that uh, we use in our labs using optical fibers to access a regime of higher terahertz frequencies. And then I will move on to an idea that we uh, are still working on, actually, to exploit um, a, a pattern surface uh, semiconductor to achieve high field amplitude generation also in the terahertz. And how this idea for generation can also be used for detection and reach higher sensitivity for terahertz detection. So just to make sure that we're all on the same page today, uh, this is the electromagnetic spectrum of light with the, um, with the microwaves on one side, with the UV on the other side, going from low to high frequencies. And whenever I talk about terahertz today, I'm going to be referring to uh, optical frequencies around 10 to the 12 hertz, or 1 terahertz. And uh, this is a loose definition. It's kind of broad if you look at the spectrum. But it is possible that you have never heard of terahertz before. And that's not so unusual. It is because it's a type of radiation which is very, very hard to generate and detect. But there's a lot of incentive to develop better sources and detectors in this region because once you have it, there's a lot of nice advantages of using terahertz radiation. Well, first, it can be used to go through plastics, cardboards, fabrics, ceramics, optical medium, which are usually uh, opaque to the visible. And some people would say that Superman has X-ray visions, but I think science is still undecided on that. It could also be terahertz vision. You also have, uh, in terahertz radiation, low photon energy. So it is a non-invasive uh, technique. So this is this is non-invasive, so it would be good for medical imaging, for example. And uh, in this region, in the terahertz region here, we cover a lot of rotational and vibrational modes of molecules and materials. So if you could see in this region, the world would be even more colorful. Uh, so this is a picture that I took last weekend in Ottawa. This is already very colorful at, at this time of the year. Uh, but if you were able to see in the terahertz, then you would be able to get even more colors. That's the point here. OK, so there's, uh, because of all these nice applications, there's a lot of incentive of bringing terahertz technologies into uh, applications. And there's already, it has already entered some of the large markets out there. Security is one example, because it can go through clothing. You can now detect if this guy has a gun here. Uh, for this one example, I told you about the fact that you can resolve different spectral transitions uh, of molecules, so uh, everything is, 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 uh, has a signature in the terahertz regime, so you can differentiate different molecules. It's a great property to look uh, uh, for quality control industries or for food quality control or pharmaceuticals. This is an example here about pharmaceuticals. Same thing for medical imaging. There's now some um, protocol that will use terahertz for wireless communication. And maybe more a fun fact than 
a large market, terahertz can also be used to read a book without having to flip the pages. So you can time resolve the terahertz and it will interact differently whether it hits ink or if it hits just the page. So this has been demonstrated recently. So there's, uh, so with all these nice applications, there's a lot of incentive to develop better sources, detectors. Um, and it is all about the field of terahertz photonics. But in our lab, we're interested in a subfield of terahertz photonics. It's called ultra-fast terahertz spectroscopy. And it's a very powerful technique to look at microscopic interactions, which are all in this energy range. I'm going to give you some example from some of my previous work. So you can use ultra-fast terahertz spectroscopy to look at phonons and car carrier, um, carrier's uh, dynamics inside 2D materials, for example. You can also use um, the same technique to look at condensing, exciton polaritons, or um, and this, these are also subjects we're interested in looking uh, at in our labs, at plasmonic resonances and enter transitions on quantum wells. And finally, you could also use it to look at chemical reactions and polymer structural changes. In this talk, however, I will focus on the uh, innovations on terahertz photonics. I'm not going to go into these more condensed matter uh, areas. It, they are very interesting, but the way I see it is the innovations will allow us to design a better instrument to look at these systems. So uh, talking about innovations, what we are innovating is the generation and the detection and uh, the, the terahertz scheme in general. And this is what I will describe in this slide. It's going to be a bit technical, but I'd like you guys to keep up with me because the rest of the talk is basically going to be about looking at different sections of this setup here and see how we can make it better. Uh, so everything starts with an ultra-fast near-infrared source uh, delivering femtosecond pulses. These pulses are focused onto a nonlinear crystal here. And, um, oops, I'm going to come back here. Uh, the terahertz generation is uh, possible due to a three wave mixing, a nonlinear process inside this nonlinear crystal, which has a chi 2 coefficient. And so you can think of it as having two spectral components of this pulse delivered by this laser, which is femtosecond pulse, so it has a broad bandwidth. And by a three wave mixing process, these two components can generate low energy radiation. And just because of these lasers have a bandwidth of roughly one to four terahertz, degeneration, degenerated light here will also have a bandwidth of roughly one to four terahertz. So this is how the generation mechanism works. Uh, I'd like you to keep this in mind. I'm gonna come back to it also a bit later. Um, and now the detection. We are gonna, we're gonna take another pulse from the same laser. We're gonna overlap this pulse in time and in space into another nonlinear crystal like this one here. And you can think of the terahertz as having very, very long wavelength. And the femtosecond pulse is very short in comparison. So effectively, it probes only a small section of it, which is like a DC field for this near infrared pulse. So due to a Puckel's effect inside the nonlinear crystal here, there's gonna be a rotation of the polarization of this near infrared pulse here, and this is what we detect with this optics right there. So we have one data point, but this is not much information, but we can repeat the same process at a different delay between the, the terahertz pulse and a near infrared pulse, and in this case, we get a signal which is negative, and we can repeat it again, and then we get another signal which is a bit uh, lower amplitude than the first one. And actually, we can repeat the, the whole process on a continuous uh, scan, and being able to retrieve the full oscillating terahertz, um, terahertz transient here. Sorry, this one here. So we get amplitude and phase information of the light, which we can also express in the frequency domain by doing the free transform. So now, why do we get into so much trouble? looking at a terahertz pulse. It is because it's a very powerful way of looking at materials. If I place here uh, a sample, uh, which I, I don't really know anything about its optical properties, I will see that I have a certain phase, a delay here, a certain time delay between the terahertz pulses passing through the sample, and this allows me to extract the real part of the dielectric function. And I may also see that I have some resonances in the frequency domain here, associated to the 
complex, uh, sorry, the imagery part of the dielectric function. So I can retrieve the four full complex dielectric function of this material in one scan, basically. It's also a pulse technique. So this information is obtained at a very precise time. If I use another pulse from this laser and I inject a transient state inside the material there, uh, for example, some free carriers inside a semiconductor, I can probe the density of these carriers as a function of time um, inside this material and obtain information such as our scattering time or if I'm in, I could also be doing something more exotic, changing a phase transition of a 2D materials at low temperature or things like this. So this is why this is such a powerful technique. In our lab, we have this laser here. It's a Iterbium KGW-based laser amplifier. Uh, these lasers have been very popular over the last few years because um, they can deliver very large power, large pulse energies, and some of them have tunable repetition rate. But you have pulses which are always centered at the same wavelength and always have the same bandwidth. So you're limited by, this is, this is your limitation. You have to work with that. So let's take this spectrum and launch it into our terahertz setup that I showed before. There's different, all the different possibilities of uh, three-wave mixing will happen. I'm gonna have these two pairs uh, interacting to give low energy terahertz radiation, these ones, these ones. But I can never have terahertz generated at frequency above the bandwidth of my pulse here. This is right now something like four terahertz, so I don't expect to be able to generate terahertz uh, above this frequency. So let's send it into our, into our terahertz scheme. We see this is a time resolve signal. If I do the free transform, I get the terahertz spectrum. And as I predicted, it cuts around four terahertz. This is still great. There's a lot of experiment that you can do with the spectrum and with the scheme. Uh, however, it is also the spectrum that a lot of people can generate in their lab. So it is kind of hard to be original when you're, you have a machine that some other groups have access to. It would be nice if we could generate higher frequencies in this direction to, to be able to explore some new effects in materials. It would also be um, uh, nice just in general to get more information about the materials that you're probing. But to get to these higher frequencies, I would also need to have an initial near-infrared spectrum which is broader. So how do I get this near-infrared spectral broader to get access to these higher terahertz frequencies? Well, you need a nonlinear medium. You need to generate these new frequencies uh, with nonlinear effects. And the medium that we chose is a gas-filled holocore photonic crystal fiber. It is a very powerful nonlinear platform it, because it keeps the optical field tightly confined, sorry, tightly confined over a long optical path length. And these fibers feature very broadband guidance. So it can generate new frequencies that are still going to be guided inside the fiber. And the feature that I like the most is if you put the fiber ends inside a gas cell just like this here, you decide what your optical medium is going to be. You decide the gas mixture you put inside the fiber, the pressure that you use, and you can tune everything. This is an example here of the dispersion being tuned, but you can also tune the nonlinear refractive index or nonlinear coefficient in this case. So this is what we did. We had this laser here, and we inserted the, uh, the gas cell and the holocore photon crystal fiber in our setup. We have a pair of chirp mirrors after that, just to make sure that the pulses are always free transform limited. And uh, let me show you what happens after this, this position here to the near infrared pulses that are, is now becoming our new source effectively. So this is a picture of fiber. Okay, if I don't have any pressure in, in a fiber, if I have zero bar, you don't expect any nonlinear effect. So, and this is what we see. We basically have the same spectrum that I showed you before, center at 1030 and having about this, the, the four terahertz of bandwidth and, and um, the pulse duration is exactly the specs of the laser. Uh, but now if I start to increase the pressure uh, of the argon gas inside the fiber, I see the spectrum broadening. Uh, and I'm gonna stop here at 10 bars where we have a broadening up to uh, 8.7 terahertz. 
And I told you that the, the, the poles are, are Fourier transform limited, so we also were able to decrease the time duration of these pulses to 65 femtoseconds. And now let's take these pulses and send them into our terahertz scheme. I'm just showing you the, the time resolved terahertz signal and the associated spectrum of the terahertz. Um, so initially, it's the same thing we had before. At zero bar of pressure, I don't have nonlinear effects inside the fiber. My terahertz spectrum cuts at four terahertz. But as I increase the pressure, I see at least two things happening. First of all, I'm generating U frequencies in near infrared pulse, so this results into the possibility to generate higher frequencies in the terahertz. And I also notice that the generation process is more efficient. And this happens because when I broaden the pulse and I recompress it, the peak field of the near infrared pulse is also higher, and the nonlinear terahertz generation process is also more efficient. Um, this is also visible in the time domain. As you can see, the peak field is larger. And I'm not sure if you have uh, Fourier transform eyes, but you can see that we have larger frequencies here by looking at these oscillations becoming faster and faster as we go in higher uh, pressure there. Uh, I have to mention that these are experimental results. Uh, my student, uh, Wei and Aidan Schiffkern, they, they did the mistake of taking two good measurements. So I always have to mention this when I'm doing a presentation, or otherwise people think it's a simulation. So you may ask me, why did you stop at 10 bar? Uh, you could have just you know, go up and up, and let's go right in the visible and so on. But uh, actually, the, 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 the gas cell would explode before that. Uh, but there's, all, there's another reason. It's because uh, in our setup, we're using a nonlinear crystal, which is gallium phosphide. And gallium phosphide has a phonon resonance around 10 terahertz, so we'll start absorbing everything around this area. And also because the phase matching conditions in gallium phosphide are not so good when you go to higher terahertz frequencies. And I will talk a little bit more about it later. Um, so you can just simply change the crystal by another one. There's no perfect crystal, uh, but this one is good at higher terahertz frequencies. So let's switch the crystal. And just to make sure we're generating higher terahertz frequency, we're gonna also crank up the pressure to 13 bars. So this is the same skill here. And as you can see, we are now able to generate much higher terahertz frequencies than we had before. So we like that and we said, let's study this. Let's uh, keep this pressure of 13 bars and increase the, 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 the pulse energy uh, at the input of the fiber. So at low pulse energy, you don't have much nonlinear effects. At, uh, at high pulse energy, you have a large broadening in your near infrared pulse. This is a near infrared pulse here. Um, and the resulting terahertz spectrum from these pulses is the following here. So initially at low pulse energy, we're only generating uh, these low fre terahertz frequencies. And at the largest pulse energy we have tried in our experiment to pancreatrol here, we're able to generate terahertz frequencies all the way to 20 terahertz. So that's, that's, that's nice, but something else that we noticed while well during the experiment is um, cell phase modulation, which is the nonlinear mechanism responsible for the broadening here, naturally redistribute the spectral weight into two lobes, as you can see here. There's most of the energy is, in, is inside these two lobes. And this is perfect for us because we're relying on a three-wave mixing process. So a difference frequency mixing between this part and this part to give uh, rise to the terahertz in the, uh, um, um, yeah, to, to give rise to this terahertz radiation right here. And it just turns out that this is a natural way of enhancing the uh, efficiency for terahertz generation. So if you look at the spacing between these lobes, if, uh, and I, I actually put the, the maximum of this uh, sort of Gaussian-like uh, envelope uh, over the, the terahertz, and it fits really well. This, this indicates that we are sort of enhancing the, the generation mechanism. So, I thought it was really cool. And um, our group really liked this idea of using a commercial laser, a fiber setup, and a standard terahertz scheme here to be able to access basically any frequencies you, you want just depending on the materials. And uh, we, uh, especially uh, one of my students, Nicolas Couture, uh, got really good at doing this also in commercial fibers. So we teamed up with a local company, Oz Optics, so we can make this very compact setup here where we do spectral broadening and temporal compression. And this allows us for a low cost, compact, 
and a low power laser to increase its peak field by a factor of three. So this is very promising. And we just, with the company, uh, designed a prototype. So if you're interested for any applications, you can actually purchase it from the, the company. So now I talked about making terahertz generation more efficient. However, uh, this is always a very inefficient process. If you start with one watt of near infrared light, you would be lucky if you have one milliwatt of terahertz generation. Uh, so there's a lot of incentive to develop better schemes to get this process more efficient and uh, maybe even reach high field amplitude so we can enter non-near terahertz optics. So one way to approach a problem is looking at the generator, the crystal, the, the, uh, the nonlinear medium in which we generate the terahertz, this guy here. And you would be looking for materials that has uh, four properties. You would like this material to have a high chi 2 coefficient leading to an efficient three-wave mixing or difference frequency mixing process. You would like this material to have a high optical damage threshold so you can pump it hard with the laser. Uh, to have a low terahertz absorption. Of course, you don't want to absorb what you generate. But most of the time, the, the deal breaker is uh, phase matching conditions. Uh, you need these phase matching conditions so that you can use a relatively thick crystal to take advantage of the interaction length inside this crystal while being able to generate the terahertz wave in a coherent way. And this is very difficult to find. Usually, uh, in a standard collinear geometry, you would have the wave vector of the terahertz wave, which is dictated. It has to be uh, the difference between the wave vectors of the spectral components in your near infrared pulse. It's very stringent condition. Not so many materials will have this property. But there's also another way of approaching the problem. You can use a non-collinear geometry where you have your near infrared pulse in one direction and a terahertz pulse is generated in the other direction. Uh, and this will relax the condition to a, some, some extent. But beautifully, now some materials that were not considered for terahertz generation can be considered. And maybe these materials, they have very nice, uh, they have these three properties here that we're looking for. So this is something that to consider. This is not a new idea. Uh, there's a scheme out there. It's called a tilted pulse front terahertz generation in lithium niobate. And this is sort of broadly used. Uh, so it consists in having a near infrared pulse diffracted on the grating, tilting its pulse front, going inside a lithium, lithium niobate crystal, and generating the, the terahertz in another direction. It is a very complex geometry to align. Nothing is uh, 90 degree. Um, and this guy, who one of the guys who came up with this idea, sorry, uh, Headlings, actually proposed, yeah, I, I agree it's a complex scheme, so let's try to uh, simplify the whole thing. Let's put the grating directly at the surface of the semiconductor like this here. And now we have another uh, sort of non collinear geometry inside, but it's not so bad outside. And more recently, uh, Bakunov and Bodrov proposed, what if we put a perfect phase grating on the surface of this semiconductor? Then perfect phase grating means you have a pi phase modulation you don't have any zeroth order, ideally, inside, inside this crystal. So all, almost all your energy will be redistributed into the, oops, into the first and minus one or diffraction order. And this allows you to have this non-collinear geometry between the near fret pulse and the terahertz pulse inside the crystal. But outside, the near fret pulse comes, everything comes straight here, and every, everything comes out straight there. So that's, that's a way of solving the problem while taking advantage of this nonlinear collinear geometry. So this is what we tried to do. We, uh, we had gallium phosphide. So we said, let's try with gallium phosphide first. So we took this material to the nanofab, and uh, we put some, uh, some uh, polymer on it, we did some E-beam patterning, uh, reactive ion etching, and we got this beautiful structure, square wave structure like this here. Uh, it worked fine. Uh, not the first time, but after a few trials, it, it worked very, very good. And uh, we put in our terahertz setup, and this is the result that we got. Now, it's hard to tell if it's good or not, because I, I need to compare it with something else, right? I need to compare it with uh, what if I didn't have this grading? What, what happens when I look at the, uh, 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 the terahertz amplitude generated from uh, the same semiconductor, 
but without the grading on top of it. And these are the black lines here in this graph. So you can see here the influence of phase matching conditions. If I have a very thin crystal, phase matching conditions, they don't, they're not very important. They're gonna give you a, 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 a terahertz generation which is really flat. Uh, but the interaction length is not so long, so the, the, the amplitude is not so high. If I have a thicker crystal by a factor of 10, I got much more uh, generation of the terahertz, but it's confined to the lower, ter uh, uh, lower terahertz frequencies. Now what we did is a bit of a hybrid. We get not as high as the, 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 the thick crystal without any grading, but we are now generating all this region here that we didn't have before. And if I look at 3.5 terahertz, I see that it's a, it's a improvement in the field amplitude by a factor of five. So that means if I was looking in, in the intensity or the power, that would be a factor of 25. This is still work in progress, uh, where we think we can do better than that uh, in terms of higher frequencies. Uh, so stay tuned, and there's gonna be more results on that coming up soon. Now, you may also remember that I mentioned the detection process, which is also relying on the nonlinear interaction between a near-infrared pulse and a terahertz pulse inside another detection crystal, this one here. Well, it turns out that phase matching conditions are also gonna be important for the detection process, and it should also be considered. As an example, if I have a very thin crystal where phase matching conditions don't matter too much, I get a very flat uh, response for, of my detector, in spectral response of my detector. But if I have uh, a thick crystal, again, I get better sensitivity, but confined to the lower terahertz frequencies. Now, is it possible here to uh, use the grading approach and sort of uh, play with this non-collinear geometry? Yes, you can do this. And here, what you have to do is you only have to pick up this diffracted order from the grading and launch it into the detection setup. So it's not, it was not obvious to us initially, but this is a much simpler approach than the first one that I presented. It doesn't matter if the grading is good or not because you're only looking at the diffracted order. And this allowed us to use much more grade, some of the gradings which were not so good for a generation. They're still very good for the detection. So we could, uh, we could do this experiment with more gradings. So this is an example here where we had one millimeter uh, thick crystal, so this is the same curve here, and now we put some different gratings with different, per, different per pitch uh, on, this, uh, on the sample, and uh, the, these periods were designed to get phase matching conditions at these different terahertz frequencies, three, four, and five. And here we notice uh, well, three things, I would say. First of all, we generate higher frequencies. Bingo, we got it. Second of all, we do see that we're going towards higher and higher frequencies for different gradings. And uh, maybe surprisingly, we don't lose any signal in the low terahertz frequencies. I'm just shif shifting my phase matching uh, conditions. I should have lost something here. Um, this, um, this is still, th this numerical simulation shows that this is exactly what you would expect, but I'm not sure I can present a very uh, convincing physical picture why but there's, another, there's different parts that contribute to this effect, and one of them uh, I, can ex I can explain to you, and it's a very cute effect that we discovered after the fact, is we are using a horizontally polarized beam for our detection, like this one here. This is horizontal, okay? And the diffracted order then becomes a S polarized wave. The interaction of this near infrared pulse with a terahertz create an orthogonal component. This becomes a P wave inside a crystal. And at the back side of this sample, the P wave is preferentially transmitted through the material. So when we're looking at the signal, we are seeing an enhanced sensitivity due to the fact that relative to the overall power, we have more signal coming from the interaction of the pulse with the terahertz transients. And this is mostly the reason why we see the enha this enhancement everywhere. So that was a nice surprise. Um, so you're gonna ask me, can you do it on a thicker, uh, substrate, well, we tried two millimeter, and you would expect, and yes, it works, that's the that's first sensor, um, and you would expect to be working by better by a factor of two. It's working better by a factor of 50%, and it means that we're starting to run into some technical problems, such as dispersion and uh, um, 
divergence of the beam as well, but it still worked better. So we are now using this one in our lab all the time to do broadband terahertz spectroscopy. And we used to be using this one here uh, to get broadband, and it means that we now have, if you compare these amplitude here, about 23 times better uh, sensitivity for our broadband terahertz detectors. And this brings me to my summary. So I hope I convince you that terahertz can be used for many applications in industry and academia. Um, we have started to explore uh, using uh, PCF um, uh, broadband terahertz source, uh, PCF assisted broadband terahertz source. We're using this to get the, to the other part, uh, to, to, to get to study the broadband, uh, any broadband um, uh, terahertz experiments. And we have also started to play with these gratings on top of semiconductors. Uh, we have already uh, demonstrated uh, uh, a scheme that works very well for detection, and we're still working on the generation. And uh, I would like to thank my collaborators and my group members, um, especially uh, for the results that I presented in this talk, uh, Ksenia Dolgadeva, Kashi Favan, and the uh, Division of Philip Russell at the MPL. And uh, in my group, uh, Weikui uh, worked on mostly on, on on these experiments that I just showed, and he will be presenting a poster uh, during lunch, so make sure you talk to him if you have any question. He's gonna be talking about some aspect of the work I presented. Uh, Nicolas Couture also work on, this, uh, uh, on these experiments. And uh, we have several projects going on in my group. Could only talk about few of them here, uh, but if you wanna know more about uh, the use of terahertz and terahertz photonics, uh, make sure you go uh, to the poster session and you ask tough questions to, to my students if you're interested in super consumed generation in PCF and optical nonlinearities in liquid phase 2D materials, terahertz spectroscopy of graphene, switchable terahertz plasmonic resonance, and single pulse terahertz spectroscopy. Thank you very much for your attention. My question is regarding the spatial temporal properties when you generate with a grading. So you're going. When you generate in, what, sorry? When you generate it with the grading structure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't you, well, do you have uh, angular chirp in your terahertz generation? And after that, does it matter for you? Okay, good question. Do you have temporal chirp, right? Uh, in, in no, the, angular chirp. So angular different chirp. terahertz frequency ah. are generated at different angles. Uh, well. I, I hinted you at the problem, but uh, no, this one we don't actually, uh, because what happens when you diffract the pulse, the pulse, the, the, the pulse front is still uh, parallel to the, uh, the inst, the, goes in the same direction than the instant beam. So you also tilt the pulse front. So the dirt generate is also generated in, in, in this direction. We, because of that, we, okay. We haven't resolved it with a camera and, and check the interference properties. That would be very complicated to do because it's so weak in this, in this region. But I don't believe we'll have uh, interference coming from uh, angular um, uh, chirp. Yeah. Never thought about it, though, before. Thanks for your question. I have a question. My question is about no, the I noise, the generated noise, when you're using PCF to, okay. uh, to broaden your, let's say, from the second laser and after chirping. So that one could also generate some noises, a lot of noises, and that process also could uh, lead to the noisy trahertz. Did you see any kind of yeah. noise generation or fluctuation? Yeah, I know there's some fibers especially designed to, to prevent uh, noise from appearing. They're, they're all uh, dispersion flat fiber. Uh, for example, in the um, holocore PCF, we are in a region where it is relatively flat also, although it's a negative dispersion we have. Um, we didn't see any increase of the noise, and this technique would be very highly sensitive uh, to noise. It, you need to, um, what you want to avoid is to have quant so some of the noise being amplified during the nonlinear process. And for this, you need to hit the, the right nonlinearity uh, of the fiber. And I think we're in this regime right now where we don't generate more noise uh, by passing the beam through the fiber. But it's a, it's a good point. It, it's, it doesn't always work this way if you're using a fiber to broaden your pulse. Could, could you give us a hint on what, what kind of interesting effects you are looking for in the longer, uh, broader terahertz range? 
uh, at what kind of effects I'm looking for in the yeah, longer... Yeah, for example, in 2D materials. What, what, materials. Uh, what would you see oh, yeah. at longer terahertz versus... Uh, at higher terahertz frequencies, right? right, right. Where I want yeah. to... Where yeah, higher high terahertz frequencies. Okay, yeah. so there's... there's um, um, there's, there's, I could, I could talk a lot about this, but I'm, I'm going to try to focus on, on two things only. Um, I presented at the very beginning of my presentation. Uh, I mentioned, I hinted at an experiment on condensing exton polaritons, for example, right? Here, for example, <laughs> that's that's uh, that, that's a, that's uh, an experiment I did uh, 2014. Um, we get. Uh, Excitons have a 1s2p transition in gamma, gamma arsenide. It's bulk gamma arsenide around here, 2 terahertz or something like this. So you, you would be able to access this, this population. There's a very nice work by Robert Kindle being done in 2001, 2002, about the dynamics of excitons and free carriers in, in gamma arsenide. And uh, when you hybridize these excitons to uh, um, a photonic mode, then you can change their uh, ground state. Uh, and you also change the energy of the 1s2p transition. And this is when you can start playing with the, <clears throat> the 1s2p transition of an exton polariton condensate, which can take any value depending on the, the tuning you have between uh, two and uh, something very large here. And that was actually one of the first incentive. How can you generate terahertz, first generate very intense terahertz so you can drive the state, which is a quantum state, on a coherently in, in matter. So could you pump it and, and basically get uh, a pi pulse and shelf this, this quantum state into a dark state that you can use later on? So for... Drive it coherently, exactly. Just yeah. not, the probe is great and, and we have already some, uh, I mean, we would all, all already be able to probe it, but being able to generate intense field in this region there's no crystals right now out there that's gonna let you do this. Not at four terahertz. At 3.5, yes, but at, at four terahertz and after, nothing. So that's, that's why we're interested in going this range. This is one example. Then, then you open the door by saying 2D materials, and now I have to talk about it a little bit. So there's also some very nice excitons inside 2D materials, which are all at 180 terahertz in this region, very, very far. And it's not sure where they are exactly, uh, but you, they have also a lifetime, and this is perfect uh, uh, a tool to be looking at, at some questions that uh, we have about 2D materials uh, or stronic materials in general, where it's very hard to do calculations in, in being exact. And the inference of a substrate and the inference of the environment, which are very hard to also uh, do in calculations. So these are the kind of questions we could start answering. This is a general question. Um, you mentioned you can use this terahertz to characterize uh, polymers and structural changes in polymers. But also you mentioned that um, polymers are transparent in, yeah. in the terahertz. So how does that uh, work? And uh, Yeah, very, very, very good. Uh, that, that doesn't fit together, right? Yeah, so they're transparent, but sometimes they will have a resonance. If you look at PMMA, for example, it is not 100% transparent. You have some absorption uh, in PMMA also uh, in a terahertz range. And uh, the idea of this project is to take a laser, um, change the uh, structural the structure of the polymer. And we know from previous experiments, which some of them were done by Ravi Bardouash, I don't know if he's here, um, and you, you, you can change the properties, the optical properties of this material. and. It works on, on, from an engineering point of view. You can even use this as a data storage, but it's not really understood why this happens. And uh, the, the, the question we have here for this particular project is how fast these processes are happening, what is actually, which uh, bound, chemical bound we're actually destroying or forming with, the, with an ultra fast pulse, and can we probe while we're doing this, this, this change, this structural change of, of the polymer? Uh, the, and there's no other technique that will allow you to do this. You could use uh, uh, FTIR or uh, IR spectroscopy, but these are time averaged, so you would never be able to look at a dynamic. So this is where we're, that's why we're interested in, in using this specific technique for changes in polymers. Uh, 